afternoon. My name is Stephanie Schmidt, a senior policy analyst on the Child Care and Early Education team at the Center for Law and Social Policy, or CLASP. I have the pleasure of being joined today by Elizabeth Wright Barak, who is a senior program director at Georgetown University's Center for Children and Families, or CCF. We would like to welcome you all to CLASP and CCF's webinar entitled, An Update to Threats to the ACIN Medicaid, What's at Stake for Children? which is a follow-up from our first webinar on the topic back in February. For those of you who may not be familiar with CLASP or CCF, I'll start with a few words about each organization. CLASP is a nonprofit anti-poverty organization that advocates for public policies that reduce poverty, improve the lives of poor people, and creates ladders to economic security for all, regardless of race, gender, or geography. We target large-scale opportunities to reform federal and state programs, funding, and service systems, then work on the ground for effective implementation. CCF is an independent, nonpartisan policy and research center founded in 2005 with a mission to expand and improve high-quality, affordable health coverage for America's children and families. Georgetown CCF provides research, develops strategies, and offers solutions to improve the health of America's children and families particularly those with low and moderate incomes. In particular, CCF examines federal and state policies in Medicaid, the Children's Health Insurance Program, or CHIP, and the Affordable Care Act, or ACA. Before we begin, I would like to quickly mention some housekeeping items regarding what you can expect over the duration of the webinar, which will be 45 minutes. As you join the webinar, your phone lines were automatically muted and will remain muted for the duration of this webinar. We will save some time at the end of the webinar to take some questions from the audience. To submit questions, please send them in via the chat box, which is usually found on the right side of your screen. You can also let us know about technical issues you're experiencing through the chat box. The presentation and recording will be available after the webinar on our website, www.clasp.org, and on CCS website at ccs.georgetown.edu. Next slide. As I know most of you on the webinar today already know, access to healthcare is a basic ingredient for children's healthy development and well-being. Children need medical care to support their physical, cognitive, and emotional development. Also enormously critical to child well-being is the well-being of their parents. When parents have access to healthcare for themselves and are able to receive treatment for physical and mental health needs, barriers to effective parenting caused by health concerns are removed. Prior to the passage of the ACA, many low-income parents lacked access to affordable health coverage because they were not offered or could not afford private insurance and also were not eligible for Medicaid. Historic gains in health coverage over the past three years are a result of provisions of the ACA that allowed many parents to be covered for the first time. Efforts to roll back the ACA, which Elizabeth will go into more detail about in just a few minutes, threaten the historic gains in insuring low-income parents as well as the record high rate of insurance among children. Losing ground on these gains would have devastating consequences for child well-being. Next slide. Today we're planning to talk about past and proposed bills in the House and Senate, respectively, to try to roll back the historic health care gains the ACA has provided for children and families. We will also discuss why the ACA and Medicaid matter so much for early childhood and how we, as early childhood advocates and people who care deeply about children and their families, can fight back against the threats to these programs. We will talk about the impact that the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid have had on children, their parents, and on child care providers, and how access to coverage and to services is so critically important. We'll talk about the role of Medicaid and specifically Medicaid expansion. We'll also provide information on how financing of the programs works and what the potential threats may be. We'll then talk about what can be done to fight back as now is the most critical moment of the entire process that has happened so far. We will, of course, save some time for questions at the end of the presentation. As a reminder, if you have questions, please submit them in the chat box at any time throughout the presentation today. Next slide. As early childhood advocates, we often focus on the child first, and for very good reason. 
We are used to thinking about health coverage, health care, and well-being in terms of children. And of course we know that children with health insurance are generally healthier and more likely to get treatment when they're sick, get regular treatment for recurring illnesses such as ear infections and asthma, and also more likely to have appropriate preventive care, including on-schedule immunizations and comprehensive screenings. Coverage matters for parents in addition to children. In states that took up the Medicaid expansion, many low-income parents had the opportunity to access Medicaid coverage or subsidized coverage through the exchange for the very first time. Prior to the ACA, more than a third of parents did not have health care coverage. Fortunately, many of these parents have access to health insurance now. This is important because children do better when their parents and other caregivers are healthy emotionally and physically. Adults' access to health care supports effective parenting, while untreated physical and mental health needs can get in the way. And coverage matters for caregivers, too. Just yesterday, we at CLASP released a new brief looking at the critical importance of health care for early care and education providers. The brief is titled, ACA Repeal, Medicaid Changes Would Hurt Early Care and Education Providers, Reduce Quality of Early Care and Education. The early childhood workforce, in addition to the children and families they serve, will be directly and negatively affected by Republican plans to roll back health care coverage. They stand to lose the affordable health care so important to their own well-being. The loss of coverage threatens their own family economic stability and, in some cases, their ability to remain on the job. So affordable coverage matters greatly for children, but also matters a lot for their parents and for child care providers, too. Next slide. With so much happening federally, it's very hard to keep track of what's happening across health care or all the other issue areas, too. So we wanted to highlight some of the key events that have happened in this process since the last webinar we did back at the end of February. In March of 2017, the American Health Care Act, or the AHCA, was introduced by House Republicans and after much debate, changes, and delays, was voted on two months later and narrowly passed in the House. The bill had devastating impacts for children and families, which Elizabeth will talk about more about in just a few minutes. Since then, Senate Republicans have been working to craft their own version of the bill with equally devastating impacts for children and families. All reports up until today suggested that the Senate bill will be voted on this week, but breaking reports right before this webinar suggested maybe the vote wouldn't happen until after the July 4th recess. But regardless of whether the vote happens now or in a few weeks, it's more important than ever to put pressure on right now and to keep it on until a vote happens or maybe doesn't happen. And with that, I'll pass it over to Elizabeth to talk more about what's included in the bill. Elizabeth? Great. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, and, you know, I'm going to talk um, in some broad details about um, the provisions in both bills, um, especially related to Medicaid. Um, but what I will say up front is that um, the bills are very, very similar. Um, I can talk about a few minor details in terms of differences, but they're very similar um, in terms of their effect. Um, and both would certainly um, risk reversing this very trend line you see and bringing uninsured rates of uninsured children to all-time lows. We are at um, under 5% of uninsured children nationally, and that's, of course, thanks to Medicaid and CHIP and the Affordable Care Act. Um, and I think that if you go to the next slide, um, as Stephanie mentioned, we are also seeing, seen, especially since the advent of the Affordable Care Act in 2014, when it took full effect, that many parents and other adults and caregivers have also um, gained coverage. So both of the bills, as you'll see, um, the effects are pretty much the same in that they would have a net, an effect of potentially reducing all of these gains we've seen um, in recent years for kids and families. So next slide. So just a refresher, when it comes to children um, of all incomes, nearly half are in employer-sponsored insurance, but well over a third are in Medicaid and the Children's Health Insurance Program. So you'll see in the next few slides why I'll be talking mainly about Medicaid uh, and CHIP today, and particularly Medicaid, because that's really where 
the major changes are with respect to what kids and families need. Next slide. Um, when you just look at public courses, for, sources of coverage for kids, again, Medicaid is the big player. In terms of children, it covers 37 million. CHIP covers 9 million children. And in the marketplace created by the Affordable Care Act, um, just over a million children. Next slide. Um, more statistics for you, and I should note that um, we have the data on this slide available for every state on our website, and I think we have the link to the, that page at the end of this presentation. Um, but nationally, when you look at kids living just over the poverty line, it's the majority of kids in Medicaid or CHIP, nearly half of all children under six, infants, toddlers, and preschoolers. Um, a good chunk of kids with disabilities, all the children in foster care, and nearly half of births in newborn coverage. Um, in addition, um, more than half of the enrollees in Medicaid and CHIP in the U.S. are kids. So as we talk about the cuts on the table for Medicaid, you know, if half of the program is made up of children, it's hard to imagine that they wouldn't um, really put kids in the crosshairs and certainly their families. Next slide. Um, one thing we like to point out to folks uh, when it comes to Medicaid is research in the last few years has shown, you know, not only is coverage and particularly Medicaid coverage an important investment in children's health um, over time, um, longitudinal research um, from the 80s and 90s has shown that as adults, kids who got Medicaid um, we're more likely to complete high school, complete college, and earn higher wages as adults. Um, so truly, it is an important investment, not just in health outcomes, but, as, but also educational and economic outcomes. Next slide. So in addition to being a critical source of coverage for kids, um, Medicaid is a major source of funding um, for state budgets. So if you take all the federal money going into states, nearly 60% um, of those funds are federal Medicaid dollars. Federal Medicaid dollars going into states is more than any other federal program combined. That includes education in terms of federal dollars, so education, corrections, transportation, higher ed. Uh, Medicaid is really the big federal budget item, the biggest federal budget item going into states. Next slide. So in terms of the repeal and replace bill, and I know we talked about what we expected to see on the last webinar. We have a little more detail on what we have seen, which is very similar to what we expected. But this is where we see sort of a perfect storm. We know in these proposals that Medicaid is at risk like never before. Not only are these um, bills, both of the House and the Senate, looking to repeal the ACA's Medicaid expansion that covered many parents and other adults. It goes well beyond that and makes deep cuts to Medicaid that would fundamentally change the way Medicaid has worked and been financed for over 50 years now. So major, it, it goes well beyond just ACA repeal. We also know that CHIP funding, you know, unlike Medicaid, which is entitlement and guaranteed open-ended funding for states, um, at their federal match level. The CHIP program um, is a block grant, so Congress has to come back and uh, reauthorize it every few years. Funding, federal funding for CHIP uh, will expire at the end of this federal fiscal year, so September 30th. And we also know for a variety of reasons, um, including some questions about sort of implementation and funding by the current administration that the marketplace's future is uncertain, not only because of um, implementation of current law, but also in, in terms of these proposals. Next slide. Okay, so what are in these bills? Next slide. So this is a very busy slide. Um, and I will, and there are certainly differences between the House and Senate bill, and I can send anyone who wants some details, but when it comes to the marketplaces and private insurance side, the bottom line is that in the individual market and even to some extent in other, in the group market, um, folks that are receiving coverage today, particularly in marketplaces, would have to pay more 
for less comprehensive care, particularly older adults. The way they um, have restructured tax credits, they've uh, eliminated cost-sharing reductions, and they've essentially allowed states to uh, will it, would allow states to um, define their own essential health benefits. So truly, it would mean um, skimpier coverage at a higher cost um, than folks are getting it today. And that's on the private side. Next slide. In terms of Medicaid, uh, you know, that's where we think some of the real big damage could be done to children and their families. Um, it, the Medicaid proposals in both bills significantly cap federal Medicaid funds to states. Um, they do this through what's called a per capita cap, and then both of them also have a block grant option for certain populations um, included, and that is deeper cuts over time and a fixed amount and a block grant. The Medicaid um, changes it also, and I'll talk a little more about those caps in a minute. Um, but both bills would end effectively the ACA Medicaid expansion to adults um, by lowering the match rate over time um, and uh, initially allowing no new adults to be enrolled in that category and then phasing out the match. So in effect, they would, it would end um, the Medicaid expansion to adults. And it also has a number of other minor eligibility changes, but quite troubling for vulnerable families. So it would, in the House bill, require, and in the Senate bill, give states the option to do renewals for coverage every six months, which is a lot more red tape in the process, both for parents and families and for, and for states. It would end um, presumptive eligibility for hospitals that help um, fast track coverage for folks. Um, based on a simpler eligibility process. It would end 90-day retroactive coverage in Medicaid, which is a critical um, thing for folks who are facing potential financial catastrophe for unexpected health care needs. And that's been something that's been part of the Medicaid program for a long time. Um, and then for non-disabled adults, which is defined a number of ways, um, with a number of exceptions, both bills would allow states to impose work requirements for non-disabled adults um, and actually have financial incentives for states to take that option. Next slide. So back to the caps. Both bills would fundamentally restructure Medicaid financing and from our perspective end the federal-state partnership as it exists today. Um, today, Med Medicaid is an entitlement there are certain federal minimums that states must meet, but they have a lot of discretion over eligibility and enrollment procedures. Um, but for anyone who is deemed eligible in a state, the, the federal government will pay a portion of those costs, ranging from 50 to 75 percent, depending on what state you're in. Um, under these proposals, there's sort of an arbitrary cap by a very complicated formula placed on federal Medicaid funds, and those cuts grow over time. So instead of being a strong federal partner and there to basically meet all of the health costs and health care needs that states might have, at some point that federal funding over time will run out and states are left on the hook to try to make up for those costs. So there are caps for everyone in Medicaid, but then as I mentioned, um, both bills have the option for states to take a block grant. So the per capita cap formula is sort of a um, it's a formula that, based on per person spending, builds a spending cap. It doesn't mean that everyone who comes in the in the door is going to have a, a price tag attached to them. All that per capita actually does, and it's quite confusing, is set the spending target for every year, and um, it grows at particular growth rates over time. But if a state goes over that spending cap, um, they're on the hook and have to either pay back money or their or their cap is reduced in future years. A block grant option is even more um, rigid in terms of its growth over time and more static, um, so a lot less wiggle room in terms of the federal contribution. So states, in addition to everyone being in this cap, with some specific exceptions, states have the choice to block grant um, services for adults, that's in both the House and Senate bills, or in the House bill, they can block grant services for children and adults as an option. Next slide. 
So regardless of whether you're talking about block grants or per capita caps, this is really what happens. And I know I had this slide before, but I love the visual that the Center on Budget put together because I think it helps, or helps show what's happening. So on the left side is the current Medicaid financing system. So if you're in a state with a 60% federal match where the, 60, where the government play, pays 60 out of every $100 um, and the state kicks in the $40, as health costs grow, maybe there's a, a, an EpiPen spike in, in cost or a Zika virus outbreak or op opioid crisis becomes important for Medicaid costs. Um, as the costs go up, the federal match rises with those costs um, as needed. As, as much as it goes up, the federal government's there with their share. Under a cap system, whether it's a block grant or a cap, um, on the left hand side, on the right hand side, you can see there's a sort of an, I would say that $40 is very arbitrary, but essentially there's a federal funding cap and any increases in cost from that 100 to that $120 increase, the state has to absorb. So that really puts a lot more pressure on states to either take on those costs um, for the populations they're serving or, or cut services or potentially if they are taking on those costs, it could have implications for other, other state-funded budget items like education and child welfare. Next slide. Okay, so the Congressional Budget Office, who is the uh, nonpartisan um, policy analyst here who look at each bill um, being considered by Congress um, and look at both the coverage and the financing impact, um, they looked at both bills. Uh, the CBO score for the Senate bill just came out yesterday, and you can see the impact of these bills is not that different. More than 20 million people would become uninsured compared to current law in the next 10 years, and the majority of those in both cases would be from Medicaid cuts. Um, certainly the expansion, but also the deeper cuts that go well beyond expansion um, to other populations that states were, were funding before the Medicaid expansion. Um, in the House bill, it is $800 billion in Medicaid cuts over 10 years. In the, in the Senate bill, it's $770 billion in Medicaid cuts over 10 years. But what I will say about the Senate bill is um, while it looks smaller in the 10-year window, those cuts accelerate because they make the growth rate smaller in, in out years starting in 2025. So um, the Senate bill costs go up uh, cuts increase more rapidly over time after 2025. But both are significant cuts. Next slide. So here's an illustration of how the cuts would work um, that the Center on Budget put together. And you can see over time, uh, this is how the cuts would play out. So states wouldn't feel that pressure as much in the early years, but it would only grow. And if you were to move this chart out five, 10 years more, those red bars would continue to drop down. Next slide. So a lot of these proposals in, term, in Medicaid are often championed with the idea that states will have new flexibility um, to do innovative things in their healthcare systems or try new, um, new approaches in Medicaid. But what we often say is when you look at the depth of the cuts on the table, they only have options. This is really just state flexibility to make bad choices. They have to decide from the healthcare spin side of things, whether the cap or closed enrollment or eligibility, add more red tape to eligibility, they could cut benefits, they could lower reimbursements for providers who, as many of you probably already know, are already low in Medicaid. They could pass on more costs in terms of premiums and cost sharing to beneficiaries, or they could raise revenue at the state level, or if they choose to maintain where they are in healthcare, um, it puts pressure on other state-funded budget items. And so there are a myriad of choices that would only get harder as those cuts get deeper over time. Next slide. Um, one quick note about um, children's benefits. So uh, many of you probably know, but I will reiterate that Medicaid has a particular benefits protection for children that's been around almost as long as Medicaid, so 50 years this summer. 
called Early Periodic Screening, Diagnostic, and Treatment, or EPSDT. It is a core benefit package for children. It says that states have to make sure children get the right screenings and access to diagnoses and any treatment that a doctor says is medically necessary um, to correct and ameliorate health conditions. What this means is um, even if a state has not put in their state plan or sort of what they tell the federal government they're going to cover in terms of services, even if they haven't put that in a state plan, if a doctor says a service is medically necessary, Medicaid needs to pay for that service. Um, I think as many of you probably know, you know, the, the law is one thing, but realizing the true potential of EPSTT is always a challenge. And certainly funding caps in Medicaid would make meeting that requirement even harder. Um, but what I will say is that the block grant option in the House and Senate bill, on the House for children and in the Senate bill for kids that are 19 and 20, um, if, if a state takes the block grant, so not under the normal cap, but if the state elects the block grant option in either the Senate or the House bill, um, and particularly in the House bill because all kids could be put in the, in the block grant, States can effectively um, eliminate EPSDT protections for their states. So not only would it be harder to meet those requirements, if states take that block grant option um, for kids in the House version, they can essentially um, get out of those requirements that they have legally today. And that is, of course, of concern to us because we feel like um, one of the great things about the EPSDT protections in Medicaid is that medical professionals and not policymakers are making decisions about what benefits and services children need to make sure they uh, develop and grow into healthy adults. Next slide. Okay, so in sum, uh, I think we talked about these before, but they're still very much on the table in terms of threats in both bills. Millions of children and parents and caregivers could lose health coverage. 20 plus million over 10 years. Um, the caps on the table um, and the potential even policy changes would, would, would really remove the guarantee of coverage in Medicaid um, and certainly uh, could even not only undermine EPSDT but eliminate the requirement for EPSDT in Medicaid. Um, certainly it would, could mean added costs and barriers to care for families as costs shift to states or they cut reimbursement. Um, and of course, the thing we really think is important, particularly for, um, for, for groups that know uh, and understand how kids are not <laughs> interact with many, many systems at the state level, um, the, the pressure that could be put on state budgets and state dollars by this capping of Medicaid would really pit many important state-funded programs against each other that children need, that all children need now. So really additional pressure on, on the state budget and some of those decisions state have to, states have to make for children and families. Next slide. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was really helpful. So now that you have all heard about the potential threats that may happen to children and their parents' health coverage, you're probably as eager as I am to, to fight back. So let's talk a little bit about what you as an advocate and stakeholder can do. And as a reminder, it's almost time for questions. So please submit any questions that you have in the chat box. Next slide. Child care and early education advocates, stakeholders, and providers really can play a critical role in ensuring that children and their parents have access to vital supports like health care. As providers, you have unique insights into family situations and often know well when they don't have the resources that they need. And as advocates and stakeholders, you care deeply about ensuring that the needs of children and their families are met. So first, the most important and most urgent thing that you can do starting today and continuing on until um, a vote happens or we're able to avoid a vote at all is to contact your senators and let them know that they should focus on making health care more affordable and accessible, not jeopardizing coverage for children and families. And you can tell them that you don't want to see the ACA repealed or roll back of the ACA or Medicaid expansion. And specifically on Medicaid, 
you can tell them that you want the current structure maintained with no block grants or per capita caps. And I'll talk more about this in just a moment. This um, is also a great opportunity to tell a story. Um, so if you have your own story, you can tell that one. Or if you have stories about families that you work with, you can share those stories. Um, getting stories out there by telling them to your representatives or at this moment in time, senators, by sharing them with your state or local child advocacy or health consumer advocacy group or even by getting them published in the newspaper are really, really helpful things uh, right now and stories really resonate, resonate with folks, um, especially with um, the senators that we need to target right now. I also imagine that a lot of you are already connected to your state and local child advocacy groups, but connecting yourself and your child advocacy groups to health and health consumer advocacy groups who likely have efforts underway can be a really productive way to contribute as well, just sort of adding to, adding another voice to um, efforts that are already underway or connecting larger um, groups of advocates to other groups who are already able to organize around this issue is really useful. And if you don't know what group that might be in your state, you can feel free to reach out to Elizabeth or I and we can help connect you to the right groups in your state. Um, social media is also a great tool to use, especially since so many uh, con congressmen and women have accounts themselves these days. Um, you can use social media to share resources or facts. Um, for example, CCF has state-specific fact sheets for every state um, about coverage in the state and what's at stake um, currently. So you could pull state-specific fact sheets from those fact sheets that CCF has and tweet or um, share on other social media um, outlets um, those uh, specific facts related to your state. You can also send messages directly on Twitter, for example, to senators urging them to vote no um, to the bills that are being um, voted on um, soon. And finally, as you already well know, things are constantly changing. Um, as we mentioned earlier just today, it seems like we're hearing that the vote will be pushed back just a little bit um, and new ideas and changes to the bills are, are coming um, up all the time. So staying up to date on the latest um, is really important right now um, on healthcare and on everything else. Um, so we would recommend you connect with um, CLASP and CCS and join our mailing list so you can um, get that up-to-date information as things are happening. Um, and you can also follow us on social media. Um, and again, you can feel free to reach out to either of us if you need help getting connected or have any questions. Next slide. So as I mentioned on the last slide, one of the most important things to do today, in fact, we would really urge everyone to do this right after the webinar concludes today, um, is to call your senators and encourage everyone you know and everyone in your professional and personal networks to do the same. Um, the number to call to reach your senator's office is 866-426-2631, which you can see up on the screen right now. Um, and here is sort of a sample of what you can say when you call. Um, of course, you can say anything that you want related to um, voting no um, on the bill, uh, but this is just an easy way to talk about kids and parents and the effects that this would have on them um, using this sort of um, script when you call. Um, so let's say I am a um, constituent in Ohio. So I would call and say, hi, my name is Stephanie. I'm a concerned constituent from Ohio. I urge Senator Portman to keep kids and their parents covered and reject any health reform proposal that includes a cap on federal funding, does not preserve and protect Medicaid as we know it, and increases the number of uninsured children and parents in America. There is no way to design a Medicaid per capita cap or block grant that won't harm children. At a time when 95% of children in America have health coverage, we cannot move backwards. So I would really encourage um, folks on the webinar today to um, take a screenshot of this very um, webinar slide or to take a picture of it on your phone so that you can call your senator right away um, after the webinar is over and continue to encourage um, other people that you know to do the same. Um, we will be sending these slides around and posting them on our website so you will be able to have access to it afterwards, but since we want um, the the um, pressure to be um, strong right away, we would encourage you to do it as soon as the webinar concludes. Next slide. 
So with that, um, I want to open it up for questions that folks may have. And as a reminder, um, please enter your questions in the chat box and we'll try to get to as many as we can with the remaining 10 minutes we have left on the webinar. And while we um, take questions, if you could advance the slide to the resource slide, um, which is the next one, um, we uh, folks will have an opportunity to look at some of the resources that CLASP and CC have, CCS have to offer on this topic um, as well and be able to access them. So let me see what questions we have here. Um, the first question we have is uh, for you, Elizabeth. So you mentioned um, that the Senate will be voting either this week or likely after the um, July 4th recess. Does that mean that this is going to become law? No, absolutely not. I mean, I think what we've seen is that, um, you know, let's, if you think back, um, when, uh, back in January, there was a promise to get this done in January. There was <laughs> that moved to February and March. I think the House um, initially had to pull the bill and ended up passing it later. So I think um, it continues to be delayed, and I my sense is that the longer it's delayed, the harder it is for them to um, to get it done. Uh, so I think that um, there is no guarantee at all, in fact, that this is going to pass or become law. And I think um, the delay for this week is certainly an indi indi indication that they don't have the votes in line, not only to pass the bill, but I think they were trying to find votes, if I'm not mistaken, just to pass the motion to put the bill up for debate. Um, so I, I, I think that um, it certainly loses momentum for folks, but I think, Stephanie, you may know more about this, too. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I, there will have to – what we were hearing um, – uh, like I said, everything's changing um, by the minute, but what we were hearing previously is that the Senate would potentially vote this week and then it would go to the House and the House would vote on the Senate version. But since we do have the delay, which is actually one of the questions we got to is, is the vote delayed. Um, a lot of reputable sources are reporting this afternoon that the, the vote is likely delayed until after the July 4th recess. Um, so we don't really know what will happen um, in terms of uh, the precise time or the negotiations that will have to come following the Senate vote between the Senate and the House to get to some sort of agreement on what will be included in the bill. So there's a lot more to come, um, I think, um, in, the, in the coming weeks, but really important for senators to hear right now um, that this is um, not something that's okay and it's a bill that is bad for children and families and really need to, to push back against. Um, that right now and keep the momentum moving forward as this whole process moves forward as well. Um, Elizabeth, another question for you. Maybe I missed it, but what are the options for states? They can choose to accept the block grant or what are the other options? Can you just review that um, portion sure. of your question? Yes, and I and I and I kind of glide over because it's it's quite complicated. And if folks want to get into the intricacies of formulas, by all means, <laughs> you can reach out to me. Um, I, the, under the Medicaid caps, which by any measure are cuts, um, everyone goes into caps in both bills, um, with the exception in the Senate bill that they aim to keep um, a certain subset of children with complex health care needs out of the cap. Um, so one thing I will say about that is that even though there is this attempt to sort of carve out these particular children um, from the cap in the Senate version, um, we have several blogs written by experts here that, that talk about why that just isn't possible, um, in part because um, states are still dealing with shrinking state dollars, and so in order to pull down fund, federal funds, you have to put up your state match. And so even for a group that's quote unquote carved out of a cap, the cap in and of itself is going to shrink state dollars, and they might spend less um, on kids with special health care needs um, in terms of drawing down federal dollars. So in essence, there's just no workable way, despite appearances, to carve populations out, not to mention it pits a lot of vulnerable people against each other. So that's one thing I will say. But in both bills, with that exception, everyone's under this cap. Um, some populations have different growth factors over time to account for expenses, but none of the growth 
in cost that's accounted for in this complicated formula meets the health cost that we've seen over time in Medicaid, hence that these are cuts. But states in both bills, too, have an, uh, have an option in addition to block grant certain populations, so have, in their minds, more flexibility in terms of benefits and eligibility and cost sharing um, for, in the House version, either adults and children or just adults, non-disabled adults, and in the, ha in the Senate version, just non-disabled adults. So states don't have to take the block grant option, but if they want to further um, have some flexibility, particularly on the benefits they're required to offer, they can take that block grant option um, for certain populations. Great. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, so I know you started to mention this um, when you were responding to that, but someone's um, asking, well, actually a couple of people are asking about the, the carve-out for mm -hmm. um, the um, high-cost kids in the Senate bill, and just sort of what does that mean and how does that work and who is considered high-cost? Could you just talk a little bit about that? Yep. So as I understand it, and I can send you all more detail, anyone who wants it more detail from folks who have studied it more, our understanding is that the carve-out is for specifically kids in, who meet, who get Medicaid coverage based on their disability status or through the SSI, Social Security Eligibility Pathway. So it wouldn't necessarily be kids with special health care needs or disabled kids who are in Medicaid by virtue of their income. So for example, it wouldn't necessarily capture all quote unquote disabled kids. Um, and it attempts to keep them out of this cap structure. Um, but like I say, I think under these caps in general, if you have less, fewer state dollars to put up for match to draw down federal funds, um, that also means fewer state dollars to put up for those, um, for those disabled kids, even in a carve out. Um, many of whom, you know, you could still have flexibility to cut benefits or provider rates or other things for those. So there's still ways in which their access and benefits would be impacted overall by a cap, even if they're, in theory, carved out of the program. So again, it's very complicated. I'm happy to talk to anyone more about sort of what that looks like, but um, I think there are a number of groups that have sort of come out saying this just isn't a feasible and workable situation. No one is held harmless by, by these caps, including kids, potentially disabled kids who are, are quote unquote carved out. Great. So another um, question a lot of folks um, are interested in learning about or hearing more about is what if you have a Democratic senator or someone who is already planning to vote no on this bill, um, what role can you play um, in, this, um, in this situation and is there anything they can do besides, um, you know, calling and thanking them for, for um, their efforts to, to vote no on this bill. Um, and I can start, Elizabeth, and then I would be mm -hmm. glad for you to spin. So I think, um, I think that's right. Reaching out and, and thanking them for all of their hard work is very valuable right now. I think to the extent that you know people who live in um, other places um, where there are um, senators who really need to be um, reached out to, encouraging people you know, either in your professional or personal networks, to reach out to those um, senators, there is a list of, of key target states where um, those senators really need to be reached, and those states are Arkansas, Alaska, Arizona, Colorado, Louisiana, Maine, Nevada, Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, South Carolina, and Tennessee. Um, so if you know people in those states, it's really important to encourage them to call their senators right now. And then, you know, like we discussed um, with the first question here, this um, won't end with the Senate. It will go um, back to the House and there will need to be some sort of agreement. So it will be important to reach out to your representatives as well. So if there are representatives that you have um, that need to be influenced or truthfully, I would encourage you to try to reach out to all representatives um, to um, tell them where you stand on this and, and the importance of um, voting no against any of these harmful bills um, would be really important. Anything to add, Elizabeth? No. Nope. That's Great. good. <laughs> 
Great. And um, that brings us to the end of our time for the webinar today. Unfortunately, um, we uh, weren't able to get all to, to all of the questions, but we will be in touch um, and follow up with folks whose questions we weren't able to get to. Um, so thank you all for joining us on this webinar today. Please don't hesitate to reach out to Elizabeth or I with any further questions. I strongly urge you to disconnect from this webinar and immediately call your senators and encourage everyone you know um, to do that as well. Thank you so much for all you're doing to ensure the well-being and health of children and their parents and caregivers are preserved moving forward. Have a great afternoon.